right. Genesis chapter 6, verse 10. Vayoled Noach Shoshavanim. So, or then, or when, Noach sired three boys. And we know it's boys because of the next part of the verse. Et Shem, Et Cham, Et Yafet. Shame, the great ones are the names. Cham and Yafeth. Okay. Smorno comments that as soon as Noach began to rebuke his fellow men, he was granted children. Right? He's already lived 500 years or so. And now he's finally getting sons, or at least sons that we care to mention. Three sons. Why? What's up with the three sons being mentioned here when we've been told this before? Kimchi comments, we have already been told this in chapter 5, verse 32. It is repeated now. Remember, everything in the Torah is divine. You see an extra word. You see an extra phrase. That's what we should be grappling with as we slow down gears now and prepare. We settle in for the long haul of our three and a half years through the Torah, right? If you've never done that before, now's the time. You might want to change your study habits the way you've studied before. Really chew on a single verse sometimes even if it means you don't get to chew on all of the verses in the Torah portion. You should read the whole Torah portion, but maybe you don't chew on all of them. At least slow down, chew on it. Maybe the rest, you get the next pass, right? When we finish the Shemitah cycle. It is repeated now, after we've been told that he hit halech, et ha'elohim hit halech, right? That he walked around with God or with the divine beings. To indicate, and the reason I'm kind of favoring the divine beings is it has the article there, Ha Elohim, right? The God, the gods, literally. To indicate that he raised his sons to serve God as well. Had they not done so, they would not have been saved, right? So Kimchi is saying the reason the Torah repeats this is so that we understand that he also raised his sons to serve properly. Now, the order of the sons is listed out of order from their birth. Cham and Yafet, this is the correct order, right? Cham was the oldest, the middle son was Yafet, but then shame is put over here at the beginning. So what's up with that? Why is shame at the beginning? So the Rambam and Rabbi Gersonides, they comment, they both agree, that shame is listed first, though he is the youngest due to his righteousness. So the other two are in order. He's the only one that's moved out of order, and that's why. And it's even why the Torah keeps the other two in order, so we can realize this secret. He also is our ancestor, by the way. So the Jews, we come from shame. Okay. The Or Hachayim comments that children in those days, less than 100 years old, were not yet accountable for their deeds. So the age of consent, consent today, 12 for girls, 13 for boys, back then was 100 for both sexes. Noah timed it so his children were all worthy because they were not yet accountable. Isn't that brilliant? It might be. That, that God revealed to him when the flood would come, and Noah was very careful to not have children until he knew they would be less than 100 years old when the flood came. You see? <laughs> Isn't that something? Oh, okay, so on the previous verse, sorry, I had, I had the, the comments hidden. Dr. Devera asks, what is the significance of the letter, Hebrew letter, hey, in Ha Elohim. In, in this particular case, along with context, I think it might be indicating to us, because it's not a construct chain, right? It's standing alone. I think it might be indicating to us the gods, i.e. the divine beings, as I mentioned, right? Rather than just Elohim, God. I think it's a hint about that. And we have an inclusio that we mentioned last time that will come up here in a moment, with that Ha Elohim, we will see it again. Yochanan comments, even those with dentures, <laughs> right? Well, back then, people aged differently, right? So a 100-year-old was probably, they probably look like a 16-year-old today, right? Yeah, and most Jewish literature considers the age in which a person learns to choose good and evil, i.e. accountability, 
to be around teenage time. 12 for girls, 13 for, for boys. And uh, I, 100 years old, right? <laughs> and I remember hearing uh, Yehoshua called in to uh, Dr. Brown's program, right? About an, a prophecy in Isaiah. And Dr. Brown agreed that 12 was around the age that the child would learn to quote unquote choose good and evil. Right, Yehoshua? <laughs> kind of sticking the bear a little bit. All right, continuing on. All right, next we are in chapter 11. And this is where we will get uh, the inclusio I mentioned. So the first verse, the first word is vatishachet, vatishachet ha'aret. So the subject is the earth. This is a nifal form. See the dagesh in the sheen, Hebrew students? And the earth was ruined. Lifnei ha'elohim. Now there's different ways we can go with this. So let's, let's look at the ruin first. PowerPoint's acting a little funny, as it tends to do. So I have a quote here from uh, this guy, Brand. He's commenting actually not on this verse, but on First Enoch, but it, it, it matters. Right? So uh, what's the verse in Enoch? For those of you who are into Enoch, uh, let me see, let me see, hold on. Uh, it's First Enoch. Chapter 8, verse 2, if you're curious. This is what this guy is. This is a commentary on the book of First Enoch. Okay? And on this portion in Enoch, it says, And there was great impiety and much fornication, and they went astray. And then his comment says, According to this passage, the corruption of the earth that precedes the flood in Genesis, and here we are around where, where we are at, is the result of human as well as angelic sin due to the sharing of Asael's forbidden knowledge. And most of you did not attend, did not audit our Hebrew class last Sunday, but what we've been doing lately with our Im immersion in the text, we've been kind of continuing the drash. So basically what we're talking about today, it continues with the verses that we don't have time for today, just with some extra Hebrew focus, right? Looking at the grammar, but also commenting on the sages, etc. right? So we'll be doing that tomorrow at 4.30, p.m. 4.30 until 6. If anyone's interested, we will continue where we stopped today. So it'll be stuff that you did not hear about today. And the only difference is there'll be some deeper Hebrew discussion that accompanies it in parallel. All right. And also my students, they will be the ones translating instead of me. So they'll read and they'll translate. And then we have all the same kind of discussion. So I hope some of you will attend. Last time I don't, I think we maybe had one person who's not in the class who audited. So and I didn't have time to put those up this week, sorry. By the way, I do have part four from the Drosh ready to go up. I just need to make the description. From last week, it will go up. Bezrat Hashem later tonight. Okay, continuing. Oh, actually, there's more. There's more discussing the corruption. I want to show you some more support rather than just Enoch. So here we have Rabbi Rashi. He's referencing the Talmud, Tractate Sanhedrin, page 57. And he says that regarding this tishachait, this uh, corruption, that it means lewdness and idolatry, as we see in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 16. Pen tashchitun, it says there in Hebrew, lest you deal corruptly. The following words show that this refers to idolatry. And as ki hishchit kol basar, and then this is an, an abbreviation. I don't know what he means by that abbreviation. It's short for something. For all flesh had corrupted. Oh, okay, it's rabbinical for etc. Okay, great. <laughs> Sanhedrin 57a, that's Rashi, right? So he thinks there was some sexual sin happening as well as idolatry. Lifnei ha Elohim. So this can mean a lot of things. It can mean before God. It can mean, and this is how I choose to interpret it. Any of you who have read my book, you see my translation, I interpret it because of the gods, rather because of the divine beings. So the corruption, at this time even, had been accelerated due to the actions of the divine beings intermarrying with man, which last time in the Shabbat drash, we did not get to that. We did not discuss it. But last Sunday, 
in the audited class, we did. We did talk about those verses, about the Nephilim and the, 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 how the sons of God, they married women and you know, various perspectives on this and why this happened and what it meant to mankind, etc. Where demons come from. All this is in last week's student edition of the Drash. That's what we call the follow-on. So if you're looking on the YouTube page and you only want to see the Shabbat stuff, okay, fine. But if you're interested in where we go a bit deeper on the grammar, but it's still the same kind of content, you can look at the SE, the student editions. I will have that in the title usually. Those aren't up yet from last week, so as I have time, I'll fill that out and get those edited. It's possible to translate the construction as according to the opinion of God. Okay, there's just my notes from my book about it. Okay, if you want to read that, there's that. Vatimale ha'aretz, and the earth was filled. And then we have to supply with, this is what we call a uh, accusative of means, Hamas, Hebrew Hamas. So Hamas means a couple of things. It does mean violence, but really here it's more about injustice. It's not that everybody was murdering one another, but the, the Talmud has a pretty strong opinion that it's about theft, that people did all kinds of terrible stuff, but it was not until they started to steal <laughs> that it really... That God said, okay, enough is enough. Sarna comments that regarding the first word and the last, right? Tishachet and Hamas, corrupt lawlessness. The universal corruption is further defined as Hamas. This term parallels no justice in Job chapter 19, verse 7, and is elsewhere the synonym of falsehood deceit or bloodshed. It means in general the flagrant subversion of the ordered process of law, processes of law. From the divine enactments for the regulation of society, after the flood, detailed in chapter 9, it may be deduced that Hebrew Hamas here refers predominantly to the arrogant disregard for the sanctity and inviolability of human life. That's Dr. Sarna from the Jewish Publication Society, his commentary on Genesis. All right, we are one hour, 19 minutes in. Are you guys okay? Do you need a coffee break? I will not go over one hour, 45 minutes. Okay, we started late because we were waiting for people. We started after five. I guarantee you will be out before seven. Bli neder. My goal is 6.45. Coffee? Yochanan wants coffee? <laughs> Would you guys like a five minute coffee break? What I will be doing is many of the slides I prepared for you, I will not share today. I will adjust them to make them appropriate for tomorrow instead. So they will be the same, but they will also have grammatical explanations as well. Okay, I, I don't see anybody except Yochanan over there in Florida saying coffee, so. <laughs> if you want to get coffee, watch the video later. You can take a break and go get coffee. Okay, let's continue. By the way, anyone writing me Telegram messages, I am not seeing them now. I have that suppressed. Okay. Genesis chapter 6, verse 12 says, Vayach Elohim et ha'aretz vehine nishchata. So God noticed the earth, or he saw the earth. This is kind of a loaded word. Ra'a, you don't see the hey, it's gone. It, some commentators, they mention that this implies with judgment, right? Like he's judging while he looks. He looked, God looked at the earth, and behold, nishchata, it was ruined. It was spoiled. Ibn Ezra comments on this nishchata. He writes, our sages are correct in interpreting for all flesh had corrupted their way to mean 
that all flesh engaged in unnatural and perverted sexual acts. Indeed, how precious is their interpretation to the effect that they corrupted with water, and he mentioned this is from Sanhedrin 108b, it's an allusion to semen, and were punished by God with water, just as, with actual water, just as they placed their waters above and below, this is allusion to male homosexuality, so God punished them by a flood whose waters came from above and below. And this could actually tie into what we discussed about idolatry, in that some of the forms of idolatry and false religious practices, they do include temple prostitutes, these sorts of things, right? Which is obviously abominable. Dr. DeVere says, tomorrow's session will be good for everyone. Right, so everyone can join. If you have time, you wanna join us tomorrow, same time, but really 4.30, not 5.03. <laughs> we'll do for an hour and a half, we get out pretty sharp at six, it's pretty controlled. So 4.30 until six, the drosh will continue, all right? It will just be a little deeper on Hebrew grammar, right? For the And the Hebrew students will be the ones translating, not me. But then I will discuss these things that you see now, yeah? Uh, Tet says, oh, Patricia says, so appropriate, Hamas, the terrorist group, chose that name, indeed. Unfortunately, today, we seem to be much closer to those days of Noah, I agree. Tet says, wow, if only those committing these sins know this, right? They're bringing destruction on their city, on the places that tolerate, on the places that that uh, celebrate it as somehow brave or something like this. Patricia comments, especially when you hear what kinds of laws and school curriculum they're pushing in America. Yes, in some states, in the blue states, the states run by the Democrat Party, that's correct. Yes. Usually they get pushback in the red states. You have, for example, in Florida, the Republican governor uh, threatening to punish school administrators with arrest and imprisonment if they do not stop trying to sneak in certain leftist curriculums. Okay. Ki hishchit kol basar et dakul al haaretz. For all flesh had ruined Literally, Dalko, its path, its way upon the earth. It's interesting, the all flesh. You see Ibn Ezra engaging a bit with that part of the text as well. What does it mean, all flesh? So let's look at all flesh, Hebrew kolbasar. And I'm sorry, this was not available in English, so I just copied it quickly in the Hebrew. This is Midrash Rabbah on Genesis, chapter 28, verse 8. This is a very reliable Midrash compared to other Midrashim. And it says that uh, this rabbi, in the name of that rabbi, uh, by this one, he said that uh, everything in that which had was doing things in that generation before the, of the flood, <laughs> that uh, he's talking about the sexual sin, that the dog would stand before the wolf, right, meaning letting the wolf have sex with it, and that the uh, the um, the male chicken, with the rooster, would uh, stand before the the peacock, right? And so that basically, the the what's interesting is Midrash Rabbah it doesn't go into the angelic effect on this. I think what's happening is because it's not just because of humankind's sins, but as we established before, it's the watchers, right? It's these fallen angelic beings, these fallen divine beings. They've mixed with nature. They've crossed a supernatural barrier that ought not to be crossed. And it is affecting all of mankind, right? Just as Adam's sin and Chava's sin in the garden affected creatures as well. In the garden, there's no indication of any animal being carnivorous, only of vegetarianism, right? Kind of the ideal from God was vegetarianism in the garden. And for those of you who think, oh my gosh, are you going to say we have to be vegetarians? Well, I do not think vegetables today are the same as they were in the garden, okay? The first generation plants, can you imagine how great they were? So how nutritious they were? The proteins you had from those plants, can you imagine? And probably there are some species we don't even have anymore because they needed the extra dense atmosphere from the water blocking out harmful radiation from the sun that was above the rakia, above the expanded boundary. Dr. Devera comments, is the sin 
of Saddam of the same degree as that of Noah's time, Noah's time. Well, from the human perspective, I would say yes. Because it caused God to interfere with the natural order and do a miracle, right? By destroying them, right? It was so egregious that he could not leave it unnoticed. It's more like a localized example. From the perspective of the fallen sons of gods, I would say not, right? Or at least lesser so. It seems like they were really running wild in the times before the flood, at least we get examples of this in the Second Temple literature about that period before the flood, what was happening. I'm not aware of much of this happening in Saddam and Gomorrah, too much wicked angelic inter interference. I think it's mostly on the humans. Yochanan says, was the Garden of Paradise without chocolate? You didn't need chocolate. You could just eat the cacao leaf. And it was so... Mm, scrumptious. We don't need it to be processed. Tet says, stronger spirit of evil, no ruach. Perhaps the human sin was at, was at a greater level, or at least the accumulation of sins collected. Remember, we have many Hebrew words, they have a cause and effect meaning, depending on how they're used, right? So for example, asham is to be guilty, right? And an asham is also guilt, but it's also an asham, Hebrew asham, is also a, uh, a guilt sacrifice, right? Like a sacrifice for guiltiness, right? So it's a good thing that cancels out the bad, right? Hebrew avon is, um, it's a willful sin, a sin where the person knows it's wrong, but they do it anyway. But Hebrew avon also means, uh, what's it called? Not guilt. So much more like uh, blame. Uh, what's like a guilt that you can accrue? Like uh, you have a bunch of it. Like the more you do, the more of it you have, right? The more sin you do, the more. I guess blame is the best I can do for now. If someone thinks of a better word, there is a better word in English for that. But so you accrue this blame, this guilt, maybe, right? Yeah, you do become more callous. But the Bible has this concept of the more a city sins. And it can be over generations, right? You might have one generation, they've died, their children are wicked too, they keep sinning. It accumulates Hebrew avon. It gets stored up, right? So that the city itself, the location is polluted from this avon. This guilt, this shame, all this stuff. It stores it up. And so that's what happened in the case of Saddam and Amora. They had too much of it stored up. Too much avon happened and it stored up avon. And the sages say that's why, well, they, they, they hint at that's why Lot chose to go to the little town, Seira, right? The insignificant one, it means. Because it was a younger town and younger cities have not accumulated as much blame as big cities, right? This is why any time you go to a large metropolis, metropolitan area, even if it's in a religious country or state, like the South in the United States is very religious, right? There's, we say there's a church on every corner. It's called the Bible Belt, right? So for those of you who've never been to America, judge fairly, you know, when you see the Hollywood stuff, that's not quote unquote America. That's the leftists, right? And what they want everyone to see. But in the South, you have, you know, Florida, Texas, Alabama, these kinds of places. You have in general, like where they're outlawing abortion now, you have a more religious stronghold. Except when you go to a big city like Dallas, when you go to a big city like Atlanta, Georgia, you know, gambling capital of the East, right? Whenever humans are in close proximity in large numbers for more than a generation, it seems those cities really do accumulate guilt, blame, etc. And they become like bastions of sin. Like the people are just ready to woohoo! They see other people sinning and they're willing to jump in and do it too. Ted says this is the same with countries overcome by terrorism. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, I'm doing a time check real quick. Okay. I'll try to end shortly from here. So, yeah, there's a bunch I wanted to get to. 
<laughs> some of you say, what about the apostolic writings? I have some stuff for there, but it's just not appropriate to show it yet. We're going to get to that probably tomorrow. Okay. So Midrash Rabbah is talking about even the creatures were perverted. Um, one of the other sages, I think it's the Or HaChayim, sorry, I only had it in Hebrew. I think he, uh, he yeah, he's the one who's talking about there's sexual deviancy, right? He's going on here, he's following up on, on the Sanhedrin, Tractate Sanhedrin, that the sexual deviancy among, among animals was also perverted, right? That the sexual acts were perverted, right? And so, and then humans were with animals and all kinds of terrible stuff before the flood. Interesting. Yochaban makes a comment there in the chat you guys, guys might want to see regarding New York and California and uh, <laughs> why they are of a certain political party. Regarding every all flesh going its own way, you can go your own way. Let's take a look at here at what the scholar Sarna writes. It is not clear whether this refers only to all humankind or whether it includes the animal kingdom as well. Right? So he's referencing that Sanhedrin bit I shared. The Sanhedrin, the Talmud, has the, has the idea that even the beasts had corrupted themselves through intermating of species. From the regulation in 9 verse 5, it would appear that animals had become, oh, that's what I want to share, carnivorous, right? Though they were not in the garden. So that as they became perverted and influenced by the fall of these various angelic powers that were now cohabiting with creation, that even the animals started to kill one another and to eat one another, which was not the natural order originally. All right, and maybe I'll stop on this slide when we finish this one so that we have the right amount of time for people to wrap their minds around it and chew on it. So here we have Genesis chapter 6, verse 13. And it says, Vayomer Elohim Manoach Kehegs Kol Basaha Balefanai Kimala Aha Aretz Hamas Mipnehem then God, notice Noha, then God said to Noah, It is the end of all flesh that has arrived before me. And this before me, a comment from my book, Genesis Look Again. It implies judgment. Because the reason for it, Greek gar, is the earth, malaa, it's filled. It's been filled up. And this, this verb here is in contradistinction to how we think about Hashem in the Sidur, where we say that he is male chesed. He is full of grace, full of loving kindness, full of clan loyalty, etc. Here we have He's so bent out of shape because the level of wickedness that has happened, the level of interference in his creation that has happened from the sons of God who have fallen, and the level of perversion and injustice that humankind has perpetrated. He goes on to say, Hamas mipnehem. There is Hamas from before them. Hamas, injustice. And behold, or so behold, so look, I am going to blot them out. And this is interesting. There's two ways to translate these last three words. Hebrew, mashchitam et ha'aretz, you can translate this as, I will blot them out, and the verb to destroy can have a double accusative, right? It can be acting on two things. It can be the mem here, blot out mem, which means them, And the other accusative could be the earth, right? I'm blotting out them, and would be implied in English, the earth. Or we can read this to be the word meaning with. I will destroy them together with the earth. Am 
my book, I comment that a variation of the word for ruined earlier in the verse is used here for destroy. So you see we have the same verbal root being used. So this is an inclusio, right? So a kind of inclusio. So previously we had that the earth had been nishchata, had been ruined. Now we use that same root to mean I will destroy. This makes us think about divine justice or Hebrew mida keneged mida, measure for measure, right? The way that God meets out justice. He's justifying his ruling. Okay. Another quote from my book, but we're referencing Ibn Ezra. It's possible to translate this clause, I will destroy them with the earth. Okay, I'm sorry. That's what I just explained, so fine, fine. Let's not go through that in the interest of time. Okay, so let me see. We all we are now at an hour thirty-seven minutes in. Let me let me see something real quick. Okay, I'll do one more slide, and then we'll stop. But it's not from the Torah, so it won't take as much time. And we'll call it for today. I want to share this messianic insight from the Talmud that is relevant to our Torah portion. So, here's the reference. This is from a book I have called The Jewish Book of Days, A Companion for All Seasons, okay, from the Jewish Publication Society. So they're the ones that call this out from the same page we've been looking at in the Talmud throughout this parsha. It says, after seven days, the flood came to the earth. Okay. What is the reason for the seven days, the Gemara asks? Rav said, this was the morning for Methushalach. The oldest man who ever lived, right? And this teaches, because you know the Jewish mourning period is seven days, right? This teaches that the death of the righteous delays punishment in the world. I found this quite interesting, this Talmudic dictum. The idea that when an extremely righteous person dies, punishment is delayed. It's delayed. How can we look at this perspective from Rav in the Talmud this is also the one known as the Prince right? He's the foundational rabbi of the Talmud how can, how can someone look at this who is aware of the truth about Yeshua HaMashiach and not think about him if the death of a righteous person who still had sin delays punishment in the world how much more so the death of someone who is he's like righteous to the conclusion they would say in German like righteous to the end like he's the ultimate example, the quintessential example of righteousness. And remember, this Hebrew tzedek, this Hebrew word tzedek for righteousness that's underpinning here the statement in the Talmud, a tzaddik, right? It, said, it, it also implies a just person, a law abider, right? It is the opposite of a lawless person. And I will just leave you with the warning from Yeshua that I mentioned earlier, that those who come to him on that day and do not have deeds as evidence of their faith. In other words, they did not have a real faith. He will say those words, depart from me for I never knew you. You work, you who are not tzaddikim, you are not workers of the, of the law, of the Torah. You are anomia in the Greek. You are lawless, workers of lawlessness. Okay, we're an hour 40 minutes in. I plan 145 is the max, so if anybody has a question or a comment, we can maybe finish up here. I'm not going to get to the whole Josh today. We'll finish that up tomorrow, or we'll try to finish it at 4.30 for those who want to join us. Any more comments or questions? Are you guys good to go, ready to eat? <laughs> it is 6.45, look at that. But we started at 5. Dr. Devera points out that violence and destroy, it's from the same root, right? Hamas, right? More like violence and um, injustice, right? Not being just, not applying God's rules to the situations. So you can translate here that there's violence everywhere, but the sages prefer to translate that there was injustice in the world, to understand there was injustice. Okay, guys, let's say a quick prayer. Avidu Malkeinu, our Father and our King. Toda lecha lechol asher natata lano. Mone'im anachnu lefanecha Adonai. Ki anachnu yochalin 
לקרוא את דבריך אדוני, לקרוא את תורתך. תעזר נא אותנו, אדוני, בשבוע הזאת ללכת טוב בעיניך וגם בטוב בעיני האדם. May be your will, God of our fathers, that you help us this week. We're so grateful that we get to study your words, we get to study the Torah, and help us, please, in the upcoming week to be able to walk really correctly before you. That we might even be referred to by you someday as, as this person was one who, someone who walked around with me, or someone who, someone who walked around even with the divine beings, that they were interested in. to speak with this person because of their lawfulness. May it be your will that you help us to become those kinds of people who turn away from sin and run after good instead of running after evil like many of our ancestors did. The one who is just, the one who is lawful, who is righteous above every person. Okay, guys, Shavuot Tov. Hope some of you will come to join our class at 4.30 tomorrow, 4.30 p.m.